Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to give it a couple minutes to fill the room here. Good afternoon again, everyone. We'll give it another minute or so to fill the room. Good afternoon again, everyone. We'll give it another 30 seconds or so to fill the room here. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on heavy menstrual bleeding and the impact on mental health in adolescents and young adult women with bleeding disorders. My name is Brett Spitali, and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will post to the presenter after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, May 14th. I'm joined today by Dr. Angela Weiland. She's the assistant professor at the University of Michigan. And I will now turn it over to you, Angela, to get us started. Thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to uh, be able to speak today on this topic. Um, as mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about heavy menstrual bleeding um, and the impact on mental health in adolescent and young women uh, with bleeding disorders, as well as um, patients that may not have a diagnosed bleeding disorder, but have heavy menstrual bleeding. So um, to begin with, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about what heavy menstrual bleeding is. Um, and it kind of depends on who you talk to. There's a lot of different definitions, um, none of them quite perfect. So, um, you know, Historically, it has been defined as more than 80 mLs of blood loss per cycle. But as you can imagine, this is a little bit difficult as uh, not many patients are really able to assess how many mLs of blood uh, they're losing. And this has even been problematic in studies as um, the methods for quantifying this are uh, tedious and not all that acceptable necessarily to research participants. So um, other definitions that have been used, um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, have a much broader and more subjective definition of heavy menstrual bleeding and basically define it as any menstrual blood loss that is excessive and interferes um, with a woman's quality of life in a variety of different arenas. So um, this is much broader and uh, more subjective, so encompasses a lot more patients, um, but is also difficult to necessarily apply uh, to patients that you're seeing in clinic. So things that we know um, are abnormal are having periods that last where your bleeding lasts for more than a week, um, requiring changes overnight or having accidents overnight, um, changing protection more than every few hours, having to use double protection. So I see young women who, um, when I ask if they use pads or tampons, they say both concurrently um, because they're so nervous about soaking through. And then we also know that if you're seeing clots larger than the size of a quarter, that is also abnormal. And uh, the reason that we care about heavy menstrual bleeding um, is for a number of different reasons, but it's actually pretty common. So it's estimated that if you look at the general population um, of women and girls that are of menstruating age, um, that about four out of every 10 women or 40% um, will have heavy menstrual bleeding at some time in their lives. And then when you think about within bleeding disorders, um, depending on the population and age group you're looking at, um, up to half of those patients with heavy menstrual bleeding will have a uh, bleeding disorder diagnosed um, in adolescents um, if they're presenting with heavy menstrual bleeding, whereas that number falls to probably somewhere between 10 and 20% uh, if you're looking at older women with heavy menstrual bleeding. So quite a fair number of patients overall um, that are having this problem and the effects of it. So then if we talk about um, 
looking at specifically our patients who have diagnoses of bleeding disorders um, and how common heavy menstrual bleeding is within those populations. Um, some studies have cited that 95% of um, menstruating people with von Willebrand's disease endorse heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, that number falls a little bit with platelet function defects. And if you look at all inherited bleeding disorders, uh, that number ends up around three quarters of those patients. Interestingly, um, you can see I haven't really separated out patients um, who have hemophilia um, or are carriers of hemophilia. Um, and actually there's just not currently really great data um, about those numbers. Although there are some studies um, in women with severe hemophilia that suggest um, it may not be as common as it is with more primary hemostatic defects. So I think that um, periods are problematic, not only in um, causing a lot of problems, but um, in the fact that they're really not discussed. And I think this all kind of dates back um, for centuries and sexism leading to menstruation in general being stigmatized and being not really accepted as um, something that people should be talking about. And unfortunately, I think this really tends to lead to a lot of downstream effects um, within the bleeding disorders community. So this um, handsome gentleman is Pliny the Elder. He is um, an ancient Roman um, and is just kind of one of the um, easiest examples of how this stigmatization of menstrual cycles really dates back for as long as history has been recorded. Um, so this was just one of his many quotes. He actually talked a fair amount about menstruation, um, but really talked about you know it being evil and associated with all these evil things and that evil things would result from it. Um, and unfortunately, these views on menstruation really have not um, necessarily changed with time. I think we'd like to think that we're all very enlightened now, uh, but I think that this stigmatization still really is relevant in all culture. Um, in that, you know, if you think about things like menstrual blood, really isn't shown on um, in like commercials for sanitary products. Usually it's that kind of light blue liquid that they use to um, demonstrate like even with paper towels and that sort of thing. Um, so I think this is still an area where people are not necessarily comfortable um, discussing this topic. And unfortunately um, that does bear out in the literature as well. Um, so uh, one study that was done actually was just a questionnaire of um, people in general, so men and women and children, um, and they asked specifically parents of um, people that had the potential to menstruate. So people that were going to, they were either currently menstruating or were going to menstruate in their lives. Um, and 41% of them um, did not plan or had not discussed menstruation whatsoever. So that's a good chunk of patients um, or um, people and this was an international study um, that are going to start their periods without ever hearing anything about it. Um, you know, you, you could argue that some of them might learn about it in school and hopefully they will, um, but if you happen to miss that day or not be paying attention, um, that would be pretty scary to start your period having no idea what that was. And sadly, uh, this extends to the healthcare providers as well. So one study showed that um, when looking at pediatricians and family care physicians, less than 10% of them actually document a detailed menstrual history um, in their well visits. And so I think, you know, although this is really sad for me to hear, it's not surprising. I trained at what I think is a great pediatrics program. Um, and I remember very clearly seeing adolescent girls and asking them how their periods were and they would say fine. And I would write down periods are fine. And that would kind of be the end of the discussion um, as I wasn't really, um, taught that this is something that I should be asking more questions about. So um, with that being said, it's also probably not all that surprising that if you look at all the women who have heavy menstrual bleeding, only four out of every 10 women um, that experience this actually seek care for their symptoms. And unfortunately, this extends um, into the bleeding disorders community as well. Um, as well. So if you look at um, von Willebrand's disease that I think a lot of people are very aware can present with heavy menstrual bleeding, um, you still have the issue where 50% of girls are not diagnosed by the age of 12 um, versus um, boys and men with von Willebrand's disease where that's a much higher percentage that's diagnosed early. Unfortunately, um, this coincides with the fact that many of these young women and girls have up to six symptoms by the time they're diagnosed. Um, and there's an average delay of 16 years between um, symptoms of von Willebrand's disease and diagnosis in these women, which is clearly um, not what we should be aiming for.
And, um, you know, I think with von Willebrand's disease, that is something where people are aware that it affects women and can present with heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, I think this further becomes a problem with hemophilia. Um, and when we look at women with hemophilia who have um, the same severity and the same presenting symptoms and the same time of presentation um, as men, so women with severe hemophilia compared to men with severe hemophilia, there's a six and a half month delay in diagnosis, um, which extends to 39 months if you look at moderate hemophilia. Um, and I would argue for milder disease is probably even longer, although I have not seen that data. And uh, what this basically translates to is not only a delay in diagnosis for a lot of um, young women and girls, but also probably a lot of misdiagnoses. So if you kind of look at um, how many women and girls are affected by hemophilia based on the number of men, um, the numbers of women affected by hemophilia in registries should be about 30% of all the patients, um, but the most recent reports are closer to three and a half percent. So clearly um, a lot of diagnoses are being missed. So moving along to um, going back to heavy menstrual bleeding, um, we do know that heavy menstrual bleeding has been associated with um, significantly decreased quality of life and that this kind of is seen across all different um, areas. So physical quality of life, emotional quality of life, social quality of life. Um, and what's, fasc what's fascinating to me reviewing this literature is that um, some studies have shown that the decrease in quality of life seen in patients with heavy menstrual bleeding is comparable to patients with juvenile arthritis um, and is actually worse than reported um, by patients with cystic fibrosis. And unfortunately, um, this quality of life um, I think leads to, and also I think it's kind of a vicious cycle where you have, um, you know, you're not feeling well and so you miss school and then um, you're not necessarily making the friends at school and the relationships at school, or maybe you're picked on and made fun of because you bleed through your clothes at school. Um, and so um, one study that looked at adolescent girls with heavy menstrual bleeding um, reported that half of all those patients were missing school. Um, and uh, even greater percentages were missing physical education um, and even social functions. So I think um, sometimes we can think, well, you know, adolescents, like, you know, they might use any excuse to get out of school. Um, but over 65% of these patients were also missing, you know, desired activities that they wanted to participate in, like parties and um, other, you know, social activities. So clearly, um, this is causing significant quality of life effects that I think um, continue to um, you know, affect quality of life in, in other ways and then um, continues to be a vicious cycle. Um, and I think when we think about why um, this is, there's any number of different things I think that um, bleeding can contribute to decreased quality of life. So this is a great figure from Roshni Kulkarni um, where um, she's kind of illustrating all of the different ways that um, bleeding can affect patients. And so um, in addition to the heavy bleeding and time loss from work and school, um, a lot of our patients have pretty significant pain or dysmenorrhea during their periods. Um, we know that heavy menstrual bleeding oftentimes will lead to iron deficiency as well as iron deficiency anemia um, and all of the symptoms that go along with that. Um, at times, our patients are um, you know, so severely affected that they have to be hospitalized and receive blood transfusions. Um, and I think, you know, all of these things kind of play into um, that decreased quality of life um, that we really need to work on. Um, and so when we think about the iron deficiency, I think, um, you know, we know that's a really big problem in these young women. Some studies have shown that up to 51% of adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding have iron deficiency um, compared to about 10% overall in um, the menstruating adolescent age group general population. Um, and unfortunately, I think as hematologists, we oftentimes focus on um, anemia and that being um, you know, the downstream effect of iron deficiency, but iron is actually involved in so many biologic processes and can cause a lot of symptoms outside of even those seen with anemia. And unfortunately, I think, um, you know, as hematologists, oftentimes we'll um, check iron studies, but I see a lot of young women who come to me um, and have had labs done and maybe they weren't anemic, um, but are severely iron deficient, um, but had never had these labs drawn. And so aren't necessarily treated appropriately and getting um, relief of their symptoms. 
So um, seeing all of this um, as a fellow, I really felt like uh, it would be really beneficial to this patient population to have kind of a dedicated uh, care model to um, provide specialized services for them. So in 2016, we started a combined uh, pediatric and adolescent gynecology and pediatric hematology clinic at the University of Michigan. We see patients from nine to 25 years of age, um, and the vast majority of our patients um, have heavy menstrual bleeding. So um, they may or may not have a bleeding disorder, um, but they um, many, many of them have heavy menstrual bleeding. The other um, kind of subset of patients that we see are patients who uh, may need hormones for whatever reason, um, but have had a venous thromboembolism, and um, so estrogen is now contraindicated. But our clinic has grown substantially since 2016. Um, we see about four times as many patients as we were seeing at that time. Um, it's run by myself and a pediatric and adolescent gynecologist. We have a dedicated social worker and an RN, um, an amazing physical therapist, as well as a dental hygienist. Um, so very similar to you know, comprehensive clinic um, for hemophilia, uh, but instead uh, within a clinic that's really dedicated to the care of these young women. And so um, getting to kind of the um, bigger topic um, that I'm going to be discussing today, um, it was actually our very first uh, clinic that we ever held uh, back in 2016. It was actually on election day. Um, and I was so excited thinking, oh, it's so fun. I'm faculty and I started this clinic and we're gonna see these girls and we're gonna change their lives. It's amazing. And the second patient that I saw that day was there for heavy menstrual bleeding. And I went in and was speaking with her and her mother. Um, and very shortly into the interview, um, it became clear that she was having a lot of mental health problems and um, had active suicidal thoughts. And uh, that kind of put a damper on my super excitement for the day. I wasn't really necessarily expecting that. Um, I think in regular hemophilia clinic or um, hematology clinic, you see such a you know breadth of ages and um, sexes and, and all different problems. Um, but I hadn't really anticipated that um, having a lot of adolescent girls, there would be a lot of these issues, um, you know, within these areas. And so um, that was kind of the most extreme example, but um, this theme of um, depression and um, you know, effects on mental health has really continued to be seen within our clinic um, over the past five years. So um, actually I think um, seeing this made me really appreciative of the fact that we were um, working with pediatric and adolescent gynecology. So um, some of you may be aware with this tool, uh, this tool, it's called the RAP screen. Um, it's basically a rapid assessment for adolescents that talks about and asks about a number of different behaviors, including sexual activity and drug use and safety. Um, and basically is a quick screen that's anonymous and that um, patients do when they come to our clinic, um, which is different than in my general hematology clinic where these are not necessarily topics that I'm thinking of or necessarily bringing up at my visits with all the patients. Um, but I think that in pediatric analysis and gynecology, these are topics at the forefront of their minds. And so um, this is something that all patients in our clinic are screened with. Um, and specifically it's helpful as um, there are three questions. So there's 21 questions overall, um, but there's three questions specifically that get more towards mood um, as well as um, thoughts of self-harm. Um, so this can be a really great tool for us um, even before we go in to see the patient where we're a little prepared um, if those sorts of issues are actively going on. So um, when I first started thinking about this and seeing a lot of these girls in our clinic that were there with heavy menstrual bleeding um, and depression. Uh, we went and looked in the literature to try and see if this had really been described before. Um, there had been one study, um, a very small study, it was 82 medical students, um, and they had uh, been questioned and had reported some association between um, symptoms of depression and anxiety uh, with menstrual complaints. Although this wasn't specifically heavy menstrual bleeding, this was menstrual complaints in general. So dysmenorrhea, um, amenorrhea, even just any kind of um, abnormal menses. Um, there is some further data um, in adult women that dysmenorrhea is associated with depression. Um, and then there's a fair amount of um, small papers um, report in the literature that kind of hypothesize or report on maybe a bi-directional relationship between 
uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression or diagnoses of anxiety and depression um, with heavy menstrual bleeding. In that, um, studies have some studies have found that women with anxiety are more likely to report heavy menstrual bleeding, um, even in the absence of kind of objective measures of bleeding that women with um, depression are more likely to seek care for heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, and then I think there's some other complicating factors in the fact that um, we know that SSRIs can have some effects on platelets. Um, it's, it, you know, I don't know that it's all that significant, but um, you know, if treatment for depression may worsen heavy menstrual bleeding, that's also possibly a concern um, within this relationship. And so, um, one of our fourth year coagulation fellows, Dr. McGrath, who's amazing, um, and I decided to do this project where we had a, um, just had a retrospective look back on um, all the patients who'd been seen in our clinic um, at that time. Um, so these are patients between nine and 25 years of age um, that had reached menarche. Um, they had either a bleeding disorder, um, with heavy menstrual bleeding, a bleeding disorder without heavy menstrual bleeding, um, or both. Um, and, um, you know, the majority of patients had heavy menstrual bleeding either with or without a bleeding disorder diagnosis. Um, and some of the ones without a bleeding um, disorder diagnosis um, had not really completed the entire workup um, for whatever reason. Like they may have had concomitant meds that prevented us from doing platelet function testing or um, or maybe just hadn't gotten really the full workup at that point when we did the review. Um, but we also included a number of patients who were in the same age range that had a bleeding disorder diagnosis, um, but had had normal periods and had really never had issues with this as well. Um, as we really wanted to kind of look at um, whether this was bleeding disorder overall or the heavy menstrual bleeding or if there was any difference there. And what we found, um, just a few things about um, our study population, um, a little over half of them were diagnosed with a bleeding disorder um, in terms of the patients who came to our clinic. And this is higher than um, you know, other reported studies, but is not all that surprising considering we're a kind of a referral clinic. Um, so it's not surprising that more patients um, ended up with bleeding disorder diagnoses. Um, and the number of patients with bleeding disorders that had heavy menstrual bleeding um, was pretty comparable to what has been reported um, in other studies. Um, but what we did find um, was there was a pretty significant percentage um, of patients that were affected with anxiety and depression, um, as well as um, a good number of them that had either anemia with iron deficiency or just iron deficiency um, without anemia. And when we looked at um, the patients who had diagnoses of bleeding disorders, um, the breakdown was um, probably pretty similar to what you would expect with the majority of patients um, having von Willebrand's disease, a smaller proportion um, with a platelet function defect, um, and then even smaller proportions of factor deficiencies. And then we had some young women with ITP as well. Um, we also looked um, and saw that um, in general, patients with bleeding disorders were evaluated earlier than those who didn't end up with a bleeding disorder diagnosis. Um, although I think this was skewed by the fact that a number of these patients actually were initially referred not due to um, symptoms, but due to a family history of a bleeding disorder. Um, so we're seen at a younger age. Um, we did find that Patients without a bleeding disorder were more likely um, in our study to be anemic, um, as well as more likely to be iron deficient, which I actually felt like was a positive thing, um, indicating that, that maybe we are doing a good job of providing anticipatory guidance in these young women, um, which I think can be so important, right? If you have a bleeding disorder and you're going into the age um, where you may have menarche, really educating girls on what is normal and when should you call and you know what should you be concerned about um, and then having them seen and and treated early um, and then in those with a bleeding disorder um, the patients that did not have heavy menstrual bleeding um, presented significantly earlier than those with heavy menstrual bleeding um, but again i think that was skewed by those patients um, that had been referred not for symptoms uh, but for the fact that they had um, most commonly a first surgery family member with von Willebrand's disease. Um, so looking at, you know, specifically our outcomes of heavy menstrual or of depression and anxiety, um, what we found were pretty um, high prevalence of um, depression and with 
um, in those patients that had heavy menstrual bleeding. So it was a little bit higher in those patients with heavy menstrual bleeding and a bleeding disorder. Um, but both of um, those groups, either with or without a bleeding disorder that had heavy menstrual bleeding, um, were much higher than kind of the nat um, national reports of, of the general population um, of young women in this age group. Interestingly, um, none of our patients um, who had a bleeding disorder without heavy menstrual bleeding had a diagnosis of depression, although um, this number was small and was only 19 patients. So i um, not sure that we can really make much of that. Um, as far as anxiety, uh, the overall prevalence was much closer to um, that seen in the general population um, of young women in this age group. Um, and uh, there was a number of diagnoses of anxiety seen within those patients that had a bleeding disorder without heavy menstrual bleeding, although it was less um, than the patients that had heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, we also did look at um, iron deficiency and whether that may have played a role in any of this as there have been some reports um, of iron deficiency association with depression or anxiety. Um, and we did not find any association um, in this retrospective review, um, although it's difficult to say as the vast majority of our patients were iron deficient. So that uh, comparison group was pretty small. We also were interested in looking at the role of hormonal contraception, um, as this is a hot topic, whether or not it's associated with depression. Uh, but unfortunately, the vast majority of our patients um, were treated with hormonal contraception, so um, we were not able to draw any conclusions from that data. Um, so moving to that particular topic, um, I think that there has been a lot of um, literature uh, that tries to look at how, what the effects of hormonal contraception, um, whether it's being used for contraception or for something else, um, what the effects on mood are from that. Um, and there have been these really large population-based studies that are largely out of um, European countries. I feel like as so many of those um, national healthcare systems provide us with a lot of data that um, we don't necessarily get here. Um, but there are population-based studies that look overall and would um, look to associate things like uh, hormonal contraception prescription and a prescription of antidepressant or a diagnosis of depression or um, suicidal thoughts. And unfortunately, although they're great because they have really high numbers, um, they don't really have the level of detail to account for um, things like why the hormonal contraception was used um, or other confounding variables um, that may contribute to the development of depression. Um, but those large studies have shown a negative effect on mood overall. There, on the flip side, have been a number of smaller studies that, because they are smaller, um, the authors were able to look at more granularly at the data and um, kind of account for more things like confounding variables. Um, and there's, there was even one randomized controlled trial. Um, and from those smaller studies where they look at additional variables um, and uh, you know are able to account for those in their analyses, um, those studies have shown either no effect on mood or even sometimes a positive effect on mood. So I think overall, um, the, the verdict is kind of out here. So, um, you know, in my mind, um, none of this that we have found is, is causative, right? It's all association, it's a retrospective study, um, but I think there's a lot of confounding variables here. So, you know, if we think about young women with heavy menstrual bleeding, um, a lot of them are treated with hormonal contraception because that's very effective for heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, so if heavy menstrual bleeding is contributing to the depression, um, you know, that wouldn't necessarily be borne out in these studies where they're not asking about heavy menstrual bleeding. I mentioned there's an association between iron deficiency and depression um, that also, you know, hasn't really been looked at in um, these studies. Um, and then there's kind of additional um, behaviors that have been um, really validated to be associated with depression, such as early sexual activity and substance use. Um, there's a lot of clustering of those kind of higher risk behaviors in adolescents, um, but all of those um, behaviors have been shown to be associated with a higher risk of depression. And I would argue that a lot of those behaviors also um, are likely to be uh, more frequently seen in those patients who are prescribed hormonal contraception, um, especially when it's being used for hormonal contraception, right? So um, we see a number of young women in clinic who um, come in and have heavy periods and um, 
their parents are not aware that they're sexually active, but that's part of why they, they actually come to clinic is because um, they would like birth control for contraception um, and can kind of hide that behind the, um, I'm having heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, so I think all of these things kind of confound these relationships um, and uh, make it difficult to tease out any uh, causation whatsoever. Um, so why does this matter? So, you know, we know that um, a good proportion of the population has heavy menstrual bleeding and that it can have really negative effects on your quality of life. Um, so I think it's really important to treat this not only for physical reasons, but um, for emotional and psychological reasons as well. And when we think about uh, the various treatments that are available for heavy menstrual bleeding, um, you know, one of the common ones I see um, started by general pediatricians or family medicine physicians in the community for young women um, are NSAIDs um, that is, is frequently used in addition to hormonal contraception when it comes to primary care. Um, and we know for our patients, um, that's not going to be necessarily recommended. Um, then you think about there's certain patients in our population that um, may benefit from the use of DDAVP for their periods. Um, although this is fraught, um, currently very fraught as we don't even have intranasal uh, DDAVP and won't have it for some time. Um, but I think it's also fraught in that a lot of these adolescents, their heavy menstrual bleeding isn't necessarily that they bleed for five days, super heavy once a month, um, but they may have really extended bleeding or bleed for more days of the month than they don't. Um, and so DDAVP isn't really gonna be a great option for those patients, um, given the tachyphylaxis that you see after multiple doses. So then we can talk about factor as a possible option for treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding. I personally think that this is probably underutilized uh, for heavy menstrual bleeding, um, but part of the reason it's underutilized is that there's significant cost to it. Um, you know, patients would have to learn to infuse or come into an infusion center, um, and insurance is, is always difficult, um, so that's not a perfect option either. Um, I think antifibrinolytics can be very help for he helpful for heavy menstrual bleeding. There's good data um, that they decrease uh, menstrual blood loss, um, but as anyone who's prescribed them knows, uh, you have to take them many times a day. I just saw someone in clinic yesterday um, who initially had told the gynecologist that um, Lysetta hadn't helped um, her blood loss, but it turned out she just couldn't keep up, right? She, she couldn't take it that many times a day for that many days, and she was bleeding for a lot of days. Um, and so I think that goes back to a lot of these patients having, you know, really prolonged bleeding or a lot of days of bleeding um, and expecting them to take a medication multiple times a day for that many days um, is a lot. And it's not going to regulate um, how many days of bleeding that you're having which basically, you know, leaves hormonal contraception as one of the best options for a lot of our patients. Um, and it is um, an option that has been shown to be very effective, um, you know, big systematic um, reviews of the effects of it on menstrual bleeding um, have shown that it decreases um, heavy menstrual bleeding from up anywhere from 12 to 77% um, in comparison to a placebo um, that decreases menstrual blood loss by about 3%. Um, so clearly very effective. And I think, um, you know, we want this to be a good option for our patients. And if it is causing, um, you know, mood issues, that is something to be cognizant of. But um, I would hate to think that the heavy menstrual bleeding may be causing some of the mood issues. Um, and that if that's at least partially etiologic, um, you know, some of those mood symptoms may be improved by appropriate treatment, um, which may be hormonal contraception. So I think this is an important question to tease out um, and try and figure out what it is exactly that's contributing um, to these mood symptoms in young women. So with that in mind, um, we did decide to do um, a larger study looking at heavy menstrual bleeding, um, again, to look at and see if we could see an association with depression and try to tease out some of these confounding issues. So this was looking at um, adolescents and young women who were seen in general pediatric clinics, um, and they were either seen um, for heavy menstrual bleeding, which was um, you know, our group of interest, and then we had a control group um, that was within the same age range, uh, but were seen um, for well adolescent visits and were confirmed in their notes um, to not have any history of heavy menstrual bleeding. And um, so this table here just kind of outlines a number of um, the different characteristics of these two groups, um, including a lot of things that have been associated um, with depression. And as you can see for all of them, so age, 
BMI, um, sexual activity, substance use, there was no statistically significant difference between the groups, um, which um, was helpful in um, that it helped us to um, kind of tease out how much these different things were contributing. So um, what you can see though between the two groups is that there were statistically significant differences um, in the prevalence of depression and anxiety, um, as well as um, how many of these patients were using hormonal contraception. So you know, double the rates um, of depression and anxiety in the group with heavy menstrual bleeding um, in comparison to those without. Um, and, you know, it's not surprising that a large percentage of those with heavy menstrual bleeding um, had been treated with hormonal contraception. As I mentioned, this is a very effective treatment and is also one of um, the more common treatments that primary care physicians feel comfortable with, right? They're probably not gonna treat um, as many patients with antifibrinolytics just because they're not as knowledgeable um, or as comfortable prescribing those sorts of medications um, as they may be with hormonal contraception. So um, basically, you know, what um, we saw was that um, hormonal contraception use was associated with heavy menstrual bleeding, but was also associated um, with these different risk factors that have been reported in multiple prior studies um, to be associated with depression, including older age, higher BMI, um, any type of substance use, um, as well as sexual activity. And so um, what we did was we used Poisson regression and actually um, initially kind of wanted to look at heavy menstrual bleeding and use of hormonal contraception and um, how those two things um, contribute to depression or asso their association with depression, um, but also how um, the presence of one may mediate um, the effects of the other. So um, looking first at univariable uh, regression, we found that both heavy menstrual bleeding and the use of hormonal contraception was associated with an increased risk of depression. Um, and those risk ratios were actually pretty similar to one another. We then used bivariable um, analysis and found that um, the risk ratios were decreased for both um, when the other was present. So um, there's some mediation you know, between um, these two variables. And then lastly, um, we incorporated all of those different variables, um, you know, which have been shown to be associated with depression. And when we did that in the multivariable analysis, um, we found that heavy menstrual bleeding continued to be statistically significantly associated with depression, uh, but that hormonal contraception did not. Um, so that association fell out once we accounted for all of these other variables. Um, kind of confirming that um, maybe some of these effects um, on mood may be due to these confounding um, factors um, that tend to cluster together, especially in uh, patients who are prescribed hormonal contraception. Um, and then we wanted to look additionally at whether um, from a time frame point of view, um, whether we could find out anything from about um, kind of the timing of when these sorts of things um, occurred. Again, this is all retrospective. We're not going to be able to um, say causation, but I think, you know, there have been um, some of those big population-based studies that showed that, um, that like prior hormonal use was associated with depression, like they weren't even currently on hormones, um, which again, to me suggests that there's other confounding variables in that population. Um, and we wanted to look at these patients to see how many of them um, developed depression after they developed heavy menstrual bleeding, how many of them developed depression after hormonal treatment. Um, and what we found was of all the patients um, that had um, depression and heavy menstrual bleeding, um, a, a proportion of them did have um, depression prior to the onset of heavy menstrual bleeding. So, um, you know, probably the heavy menstrual bleeding was not causative of their, their depression, um, but the majority of them um, that developed depression did develop it um, at the time of, you know, coming in for heavy menstrual bleeding or afterwards. Um, and then of those, um, some of them were, um, did develop depression following hormonal treatment. But again, the vast majority of them actually developed a, a depression between um, development of heavy menstrual bleeding, but prior to the initiation of hormonal contraception. Um, so overall, the percentages of patients um, that we felt like 
both within the control group and the heavy menstrual bleeding group. Um, the percentage of patients that we could kind of attribute time frame wise to hormonal contraception was very low. Um, so it was around 10% in the heavy menstrual group and um, probably about 25% where the timeline would, would even make sense for that um, in the patients without heavy menstrual bleeding. So um, as I mentioned, this is all retrospective. And so we're not really able to, um, you know, talk about causation or, um, you know, there's still a lot of data even that's missing um, when you do uh, retrospective studies as you're relying on uh, what the clinicians are recording in the medical record. Um, and as you can imagine, um, with things like sexual activity and substance use, um, these are sensitive topics that aren't even always brought up at visits. Um, and if they are brought up, may not necessarily be recorded um, blatantly in the medical record um, as you know, that's a confidential discussion. And so different physicians record that differently. So um, we did obtain some internal funding that we applied for to do a prospective study. Um, we are looking at girls uh, between nine and 21 years of age that um, have a positive screen for heavy menstrual bleeding um, and are doing a prospective study using um, patient reported outcome measures um, specifically promise questionnaires, which many of you have probably heard about um, at specific intervals um, to gauge how their heavy menstrual bleeding is um, and how you know, quality of life, uh, depression measures, anxiety measures, um, as well as collecting data on their treatment um, and how that's going. And then a subset of those patients actually will be enrolled um, in a separate study, um, kind of a corollary study using uh, digital wearable technology where they will um, actually uh, engage in ecological momentary assessment, which is basically um, just where you, you know, wear a fitness, similar like a Fitbit um, that monitors your activity. And then um, patients are able to provide kind of real time uh, feedback about, um, so like on any, any given day, they can say, this is how much bleeding I'm having. This is, you know, my mood score um, and provide some of that material that can hopefully, hopefully help us correlate um, their physical symptoms with their emotional um, state um, more than we currently are able to. So I think overall, um, you know, in both of these studies, both within bleeding disorders and outside of bleeding disorders, um, we have found an association between heavy menstrual bleeding and an increased risk of depression. Uh, but clearly, I think a lot of further research is needed. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think this is good to be aware of because this isn't something that I was necessarily thinking a lot about before we started our combined clinic. Um, but as I said, I think pediatric analysis and gynecology um, is much more used to screening for these sorts of things and um, dealing with these sorts of issues. Um, but it really has raised, um, you know, my awareness. And I think I bring this topic up a lot more and really check in with these patients a lot more than I did um, prior to us finding this data. Um, and then with that, I kind of just wanted to um, say, you know, I think the care of these patients is, is really important and it has been historically um, kind of neglected in terms of bleeding disorders, um, but I'm really excited probably a lot of you have heard about the uh, 2021 State of the Science Research Summit that NHF is putting on. Um, I'm really excited to be a co-chair of one of the working groups, which is actually focused on women and girls and people with the potential to menstruate. Um, and so we are, um, you know, trying to help NHF put forth a national blueprint um, of research priorities. And I think a lot of these issues affecting um, women and girls and people with the potential to menstruate um, are ripe for research um, as there's really a lot uh, to be done. So I think that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Lloyd. We appreciate it. Um, there are several questions that came in, and I will get us started here. Um, if factor is one of the best course of treatments, how can patients self advocate for that? And along those same lines, does it have to be a fail first before getting access to factor? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's hard. Um, I think we don't have the data to say that factor is the best treatment. I think that there is a lot of data on some of the, or there's more data on some of these other treatments, um, more data in non-bleeding disorder patients. Um, but I think with, without that data saying, you know, so a randomized trial that put people on either factor or hormones or factor or an antifibrinolytic, without that data, I think it's hard um, to get insurance to pay for it without having a failure. Um, 
So I think, unfortunately, it is difficult. I think bringing it up to your doctor is is always helpful. I mean, I think that um, I was lucky enough to sit on the von Willebrand's disease management guideline panel, and one of the things you know in that panel was talking about using prophylaxis, factor prophylaxis, in patients with von Willebrand's disease. And I think that coming out will hopefully help insurance be more willing to pay for things and um, provide you know physicians and healthcare providers with. Um, a little bit of backing to try um, factor replacement in some of these patients. Um, and it's definitely even gotten me thinking more about, about doing so. So I have patients who, um, you know, have tried a million different hormonal contraceptives and antifibrinolytics and, and kind of everything else um, that have on breast disease and that um, I'm trying to get, you know, factor for just their menstrual periods. So um, I think just the fact that people are talking about it more, hopefully there'll be more research and there'll be more uh, data to support uh, getting those things paid for. Yeah, I think, Angela, one of the points that you made is really critical, which is we just don't have the data to be able to make that argument. And I think it's important that, that the community work together to generate that data. Having a lot of one-offs uh, is not going to be helpful in the long run to be able to get uh, insure access because we won't have the data. So I, I really do th agree with you that we really need to have that research focus on this. And then we need the community to participate in those research studies. Absolutely. And I think that that's a huge thing as well. And that, you know, they've, when um, studies are attempted um, in women, oftentimes um, enrollment is, is an issue and um, participation. And I think part of that goes back to, you know, missing diagnoses and, and patients necess not necessarily being hooked into hemophilia treatment centers. Right. Thanks to both of you. Um, before we move on to the next question, you'll notice I shared a slide there. Um, NHF and HFA have put out a survey and we're asking you to take um, uh, participate in if you're a parent of a child with inherited blood disorder um, or um, um, a person um, yourself, uh, you can hit the QR code there and um, jump in and we ask you to take that survey, please. I'll leave this slide up until the end of the presentation. Um, the next question that comes in, um, Dr. Wyan is, in your research, have you noticed any connection between the level of anxiety and depression and dysmenorrhea? Yeah, so I mean, that has been reported in other studies. We haven't necessarily um, collected that data as well as, as we should. I think, again, it goes back to kind of what's collected in the chart. And, um, you know, my focus is, is generally on bleeding. And so there's a lot of, you know, baths and, 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 you know, very detailed bleeding history, but not necessarily a lot of um, details on dysmenorrhea. Um, so we haven't looked at that specifically ourselves, although other studies have reported an association. Great. Great. Thank you. Next question comes in. Um, how can we empower women to feel comfortable to talk about their menstruation and advocate for their care, for the care that they need? That's a great question. One that I wish I had a great answer for, but I don't. I think that um, you know, unfortunately, like I said, this is, this is a centuries long problem. And I think, um, you know, it's not going to change quickly. Um, I think that, um, you know, bringing it up, um, you know, talking about specific details, um, Paula James, um, in Canada has a great website called let's talk period.ca where patients can actually go and it kind of is a self bad and can tell you like, you know, should you be concerned or not concerned by your periods, um, I think so that I think can be empowering for patients if they you know have concerns and and take that and then they can go to their doctor and say like look you know I, there's this website and I have this and it says like definitely I should talk to a doctor um I think it also is difficult as in my experience um you know there are some providers that um feel more comfortable talking and some patients that feel more comfortable talking to certain providers and so you know hopefully having a doctor that you feel comfortable with um can be helpful in that um, but I think it is one of those things where, you know, as physicians, we should be comfortable talking about all these different things, right? I ask my teenagers that I see in clinic, like how, you know, I'll ask about like pooping because I'm prescribing them iron and that seems weird to them, but like we're physicians and that's what we're trained to talk about. And it's not weird or gross or, and that's how periods should be as well. Um, so I think, you know, as much kind of just realizing that, you know, that's your physician's job and that like giving them details of exactly what's going on can be really helpful um, and is really necessary because I think 
you know, they may not know and you may not know. And I think a lot of people just aren't even aware of what a normal period should be like. Yeah. Great. Um, next question comes in is, um, what have you found are the hardest parts of discussing every menstrual bleeding for patients? Is it describing their flow, shame, embarrassment about their bodies, not knowing the terms to use, not knowing what happens to their bodies, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think um, once you get the conversation going, I think that usually in my experience, it goes pretty well. Um, I think what probably happens in a lot of cases is that um, physicians or healthcare providers ask something like, how are your periods? Or like, what are your periods like? And we all know um, teenage that aren't like, you know, busting at the seams to share information with us, right? Like, and especially if it's something like as personal as periods. Um, so I've had, I can't tell you how many um, young women who say, oh, my periods are, are totally fine. And then I say, so, so tell me like what that means to you. How many days are you bleeding a month? How many periods are you having a month? How many, you know, at, at your heaviest, how often are you having to change um, products? Um, and then come to find out that fine for them is that they bleed for, 21 days of the month. Um, but then their mom is often sitting with them and says like, well, yeah, that was the same for me because the whole family probably has a bleeding disorder. Right. But in that family, it's been normalized that that's just what a period is. And oftentimes I think, um, the only person who knows how heavy the period is, is, is the person themselves. And then whoever's buying their products for them. Um, and if that is someone who's also had heavy periods, I think it can just be completely missed. Um, but I think it also is important to, you know, kind of read the patient in terms of there are certain terms like a gushing sensation that some patients report, um, you know, is um, associated with abnormal bleeding. But sometimes I'll say like, do you, have you ever felt a gushing sensation? And I see kind of like a blank stare. And so I have to kind of explain what I mean by that. Um, but I think in general, you know, if you ask very direct questions, they will, you know, share that information with you. Hey, thank you. Um, the next question comes in, in your opinion, what contributes to the delay in diagnosis in women? So um, I think a lot of it is like not talking about periods and not necessarily making the connection that heavy periods um, is reflective of something else. I think that in society, there's um, a lot of acceptance of kind of like, oh, periods are horrible and it's just what we have to bear and deal with. And like, um, you know, it's painful and heavy and horrible and maybe you miss school for a week, but like, that's just being a woman when really like that, that's not acceptable and that shouldn't be something that we're fine with. Um, so I think there's, there's kind of like the not talking about it and not realizing it. And I think within like the hemophilia community, it can be even harder because, um, you know, if you have a mom who has a child with hemophilia, severe hemophilia, and they bleed into their joints. That's very obvious bleeding, very um, typical bleeding. And, and they know like, okay, that's hemophilia, but they don't necessarily say like, oh, you know what? I actually have really heavy periods and that might be related to these like huge swollen joints that my son has. Um, so I think it's very difficult to make that connection um, for patients. Um, and I think they also in that community are, are so focused on, on treating their child who has you know, a severe disease that they're not necessarily thinking about themselves either. Yeah, great. great. Thank you, Dr. Wine. Next question would be, um, in the research, did this include anyone that has the ability to bleed and no longer identifies as someone who bleeds? So maybe a person who was born as female, but now identifies as not female. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, and the, um, I think when we did the retrospective in our bleeding clinic, it did not include those patients, but in the kind of larger pediatric study, it did. Um, and we didn't have enough patients to really separate that out. Um, but um, there was an even higher kind of rate of um, depression in those patients. And, and I've seen that a lot in our um, combined clinic as well, as we take care of more and more patients um, that... Um, are dealing with that in terms of, you know, if you identify as a male and you're having periods at all, that can be very distressing. Um, so then to have heavy periods that, you know, are causing all these other problems in addition to that, um, I think it's kind of a next level of um, distress uh, that those patients experience um, because, it, you know, it's not concordant with, with their identity, uh, but then also has all of the issues that, um, that is seen with everyone else as well. Great. 
Great, thank you. Um, next question is more of an informative uh, question or, or gathering of information. It says, what is the full name of the assessment and sc or screening tool? And what are the names of the first two studies and where might we find them? Sure, so um, the full name of the assessment, it's so bad because I just always call it RAP, but it's the Rapid, Rapid Adolescent Prevention Screening. But for some reason, it's like R-A-A-P-S if you want to like look it up. Um, and our study that was from our combined clinic um, was published in the American Journal of Hematology um, just this year. The first author is McGrath. And then um, the second study is actually currently under review. So it has not yet been published. Great, great, thank you. Um, I know we're coming against the, um, the hour here, Dr. Wine, but there's a couple more questions that have come in if you don't mind sticking sure. around. Great. Um, Len, this might actually be one that uh, you might be able to help a little bit with, but um, someone asked, does uh, Community Voices and Research offer any information in this area? So the, the Community Voices and Research, you know, is our, our patient-driven uh, platform that is designed to um, collect information about the patient experience and then can deliver targeted uh, feedback and education back to the patients. So it, it, the, the first step in that is um, it, it requires participation. So I would encourage you know, anybody who's interested to um, go to the website, um, the NHF website and navigate to the, the CVR uh, site. But I think that it, it is an area that could be quite helpful to deliver education around this area, especially if you identify as having heavy menstrual bleeding or other bleeding symptoms. Great, thanks, Len. Appreciate that. Um, next question comes in, Dr. Wine. This is for you. It's um, this has been another great webinar. Thank you for that. Um, health services aren't necessarily designed for young people, especially girls and young women with bleeding disorders. How would you look to redesign services as they are currently uh, as they are currently to optimize care for this cohort? And that's probably an answer or question that we're taking all day answer. But um, <laughs> I'll let you take a stab at it here. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's um, a lot of things that, that could be done better, but I think there's also a lot of barriers. So this is one area that we're kind of talking about in our working group is even like how these patients end up getting to us. Um, you know, I think they're like education of patients and education of primary care doctors and all of that like will help in terms of um, really making sure these patients are um, eventually, you know, being referred to us. Um, and then I think you know, we have had, um, as I mentioned, great success having our combined clinic because a lot of our patients were being seen by gynecology and hematology separately. And oftentimes we would, you know, talk back and forth about the patients when we, you know, needed um, more of a conversation about them. But it's been really nice where like they don't have to come park twice. They don't have to, um, you know, come to two separate visits. And um, I think the virtual care has been really nice. Um, something that has been one bright side of the pandemic. Um, although that's, that's, has been a little challenging with adolescent girls who oftentimes don't want their cameras on. Um, but I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things. I think um, it's definitely something that is at the forefront of our minds and um, we're very welcome to ideas that people have in terms of how um, best to reach these patients and make it as easy as possible because I think their lives are difficult in other ways. Great. Um, I think this is the last question, unless something sneaks in on us here, but um, are there any new treatments for heavy menstrual bleeding, um, bleeding disorders related or not, in the pipeline that this community should know about, um, especially if hormonal contraception has so many side effects, um, can, and can that, um, can that impact and qualify? Yeah, so um, not anything like specific to um, bleeding disorders that I'm aware of. I think, um, you know, I think one positive has been in like some of the hemophilia trials, like now they're including women. And, and so hopefully, you know, as Dr. Valentino mentioned, like getting more data on factory use in these patients and that sort of thing will be helpful. Um, I think that there are some um, like intrauterine, new intrauterine systems um, that are a little bit different, like non-hormonal based um, treatments uh, that are um, being talked about, but um, unfortunately, I don't think there's there's a lot um, on the close horizon that I've seen. Great, great. Well, 
Dr. Wine, I'd like to take the time just to thank you for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank um, you. Have a good yeah. rest of your day, everyone. Great. Um, please note that this uh, recorded webinar will be available on Friday, May 14th at hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our other archived webinars. Also available on the events tab is our upcoming schedule of weekly Wednesday webinar series. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon and everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Thank you.